evening, everyone, and welcome. You're all very welcome. Those of you who are joining us in a full room here in the hub, uh, and those of you who are joining us online on Zoom. My name is Eve Patton. I'm director of the Trinity Long Room Hub. And for those of you who haven't been with us before, this is Trinity's Arts and Humanities uh, Research Institute. And we'll preface that with World Leading Research Institute. Um, and our Behind the Headlines series was set up some years ago uh, as a way of thinking around some of the, the big topics that hit the headlines and bringing the perspectives and the expertise and the ideas of arts and humanities researchers uh, to the discussion. Uh, so it's been running for some time, and I'm very pleased to say it is supported and still supported by the John Pollard Foundation, and we're very grateful. And I'll just note before we begin that we are going to be recording the, the panel session of the Behind the Headlines uh, uh, event this evening. So let me kick off with a, a quick quiz question for you. What links Leonardo da Vinci, Paul Valéry, E.M. Forster, and Gore Vidal? Well, all of them apparently said that a work of art is never finished, only abandoned. Uh, but what do we do when a work of art is finished? Do we have the right to edit, to change, to update it? What authority does a text hold as a legal document if we can adapt it and amend it at will? What does it mean to rewrite the sacred text of a national history or to change a dramatist's instructions for how play is meant to be performed? Some of these questions have hit the headlines recently, and with these questions in mind, we come to tonight's behind the headlines topic, rewrites, necessity, or travesty. Uh, with the recent news that many of you would have seen, uh, that the publishers Puffin and the Roald Dahl Story Company have decided to rewrite potentially sensitive or offensive elements of the children's books that we all love, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant's Peach. Uh, what else is subject to change? Should language, should images, should texts be edited and altered to suit the time? Now, of course, some of you may think that rewriting books amounts to a kind of threat to literary expression or is a throwback to the era of censorship and book banning. Others will point to the fact that works of fiction and, of course, other kinds of writing are being adapted all the time based on the norms of the moment. And it isn't only children's books that come under revision. We're expanding our discussion this evening uh, to address constitutional law, writing of history, and the world of theatre as our panel considers what it means to speak of the integrity of a text throughout the ages. So let me welcome and introduce our panel to you in the order that they're going to be speaking. Uh, and in fact, I think I'm welcoming them all back to the Trinity Long Room Hub and behind the headlines. Jane Carroll is Usher Associate Professor in Children's Literature at the School of English in Trinity. Her teaching and research interests center on children's literature, landscape, and material culture in children's fiction. Her latest book is British Children's Literature and Material Culture, Commodities and Consumption, 1850 to 1914. And she is expertly positioned to talk to us uh, not only about Roald Dahl, but the landscape of children's fiction in relation to this topic. Next, we'll hear from my colleague David Penny, Associate Professor of Law and a Fellow of Trinity College Dublin. Uh, David teaches and researches in Irish and comparative constitutional law, and also is an expert in the field of law and literature. Um, so again, very well placed for us this evening. He's been involved with various constitutional reform processes in Ireland and has given evidence to, among other bodies, the Citizens' Assembly and the Oireachtas Committee on uh, the Eighth Amendment. And he's been involved in constitutional futures or constitutional mapping projects in Northern Ireland, the Korean Peninsula, and Ukraine. And David, I'm delighted you can join us this evening. Next, we'll hear from Martina Devlin. And Martina is well known to many of you as an award-winning author and journalist. She has written eight novels, a collection of short stories, two non-fiction books, and two plays. And her latest book, which I highly recommend, is Edith, a novel, 
It's the uh, story of the Irish RM co-author, Edith Somerville, and it's set against the backdrop of the Irish War of Independence. Uh, Martina has won prizes, including the V.S. Pritchett Prize and the Tennessee Literary Award, and she's also been shortlisted three times for the Irish Book Awards, robbed on every occasion, mm -hmm. Martina. She writes a weekly current affairs column for the Irish Independence, and she's been named National Newspapers of Ireland Commentator of the Year. Uh, and she's also, um, I'm so proud of this, the very first holder of a PhD in literary practice from the School of English in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, so again, uniquely placed to address the crossover tonight between history, literature, and journalism. And Martina, welcome back to the pub. And our final speaker is Nicholas Johnson, again, well known, I think, to pub audiences. Nicholas is Associate Professor of Drama at Trinity, where he co-founded the Trinity Centre for Beckett Studies, within which he co-directs the Beckett Summer School and the Samuel Beckett Laboratory. Uh, with his co-author, Jonathan Perrin, he wrote the monograph, Experimental Beckett, published in 2020 by Cambridge. And he co-edited the performance issue and the pedagogy pedagogy issue of the Journal of Beckett Studies, and I think that uh, uh, experience he got editing the performance issue may serve him tonight uh, when he's going to address some of the recent controversies that have hit the headlines around Beckett's text in performance. So that's our panel, uh, and we'll hear from them in a second. I just want to give the audience a few notes, as always, if I could ask you, please, to turn off your phones or put them in silent, to note the emergency exit at this end of the room and the other end of the room, and also just to note uh, that we will be showing some illustrations this evening on the screen, um, which of course uh, may uh, contain offensive uh, images. Uh, these illustrations are being used this evening purely for academic arguments. We are not suggesting or endorsing their content. And I would ask you not to uh, reproduce or to reshare these images outside of this discussion. For those of you on social media, as always, we're on Twitter with the handle at TLR Hub uh, and the hashtag, hashtag Hub Matters. So please do tweet uh, in, uh, as we go along. Uh, and then we'll come at the end to questions. Uh, so it will be questions from the audience but we'll also be taking questions from our audience joining us online on Zoom. So those of you joining us on Zoom, you can put your questions into the chat function and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the discussion. Each of our speakers is sadly limited to a nine to 10 minute window in which they have to summarize everything about their topic. Um, so uh, with that instruction, uh, behind them, I will now hand over to our first speaker and welcome uh, Jane Carroll. Children's literature is the only kind of literature that is defined by its audience. It comprises texts written for and read by children. But the word children means very different things in different parts of the world. It has changed, it's gathered all sorts of baggage over time. It's inflected by cultural, social, religious, racial, gender, and economic value. To be, for instance, a young male working class boy in London in the 18th century, it's a very different thing to be a middle class girl in Dublin right now. And so children's literature is this very curiously flexible and dynamic thing. And as our ideas about this audience change, our ideas about the childhood evolve, and our ideas about what texts might be suitable for this young audience change too. The idea that we've only recently been concerned with sentiment material or that we're anxious about the content of the children's books only just now, it's complete nonsense. We've always been worried about this. If we take, for instance, Harriet and Thomas Boulder's work, um, The Family Shakespeare. So they took a red pen to Shakespeare, they took about 10% of the text away. Um, the subtitle of their title page was in which nothing is added to the original text, but those words and expressions are omitted, which cannot be with propriety read in a family. <laughs> so for family read with children. So some of their changes, I mean, and, you know, their name gives rise to the term even boulderize to, to take apart a text to censor it. But a lot of the changes are actually really subtle. 
Because they kind of have a lot of messengers, a lot of very boring so. Um, they change Mercutio's line in Romeo and Julieta about the hand of the dial that now rests on the brick of the hour. And they change it to the hand of the dial is now upon the point of noon. A little less innuendo lady, actually. As Jonathan Green and Nicholas uh, Karolides point out, um, when the family Shakespeare hit the press in 1807, there wasn't an uproar. In fact, there were only three reviews. One of the reviews said, oh, this is great, this is brilliant. Um, another said, this is awful, it is a castrated Shakespeare. The third suggested that the only really satisfactory edition of Shakespeare would be a folio blank page. <laughs> um, and I think it seems that we're still locked into these three sort of basic responses. You know, textual changes are absolutely necessary and a good thing for some readers. Textual changes are this terrible tragedy. Or we all respond with this sort of reductive sarcasm that sidesteps the argument and says, we'll just throw the whole thing out and we'll never talk about it again. We have to talk about it. And we particularly have to talk about it in terms of children's literature a literature that is shaped and defined by changing ideas of childhood. Textual changes are inevitable for this type of literature because we need to keep up with this idea of what is current, what is a child right now, what is this readership looking for? So to help illustrate some of these changes and some of the more recent changes, I'm going to turn to some illustrations. These are taken from uh, the Lady Group book series. It's first published in the 1960s. Um, and in the 1970s, there were some updated illustrations. Now, the Lady Bird books have recently, as, as in early March, the subject of headlines in the UK saying that uh, they were under examination by sensitivity readers to uh, remove offensive content. But the fact is, these books have always been in the process of being updated. We see the one on the left here, this is from the 60s. The one on the right is from the 70s. Can anyone spot the change? No? The little doggy has a lead now. <laughs> it's, it's not right to have dogs with no leads out in the street. So you can see the level of textual detail that's gone into these edits. Um, we've got some others. Uh, this is an update from the late 70s, early 80s. Um, which in themselves were a very controversial edition, you know, about child safety, but we, we've still got the child in the back has no seatbelt. They weren't introduced yet. Um, but the children in the front of the car have seatbelts. It's a good thing. All these changes speak to ideological shifts in culture. Mm. Uh, that was clash, um, but it's also helping. Two <laughs> 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 jobs. Um, you know, and, and, and I owe a lot of this to Helen Gray, this, this amazing scholar who's done all of this work, kind of compiling these little minute changes over the decades. You know, and it's 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 so interesting that people, you know, now they have on, oh my god, the Lady Bird books have been changed. And I was like, yes. And they were, and they were, and they were, and they always will be. And this is perfectly normal. Um, but I want to talk about Rodin because I'm sure this is this is the thing that's really got us all going recently. Um and Dell's work has been in the public eye ever since the story broke in the telegraph in February about the changes made in this text after Putnam employed sensitivity readers to review and edit the content. An article uh, by Ed Cumming, Abigail Buchanan, Genevieve, Paul Allen, and Benedict Smith detailed the changes note in all of the texts, noting, for instance, that mothers and fathers has now been changed to parents, uh, family has been changed to backside. The um, <laughs> Rodel was originally published in America, so it made sense that it has this sort of cultural context, and they've shifted it now to a a primary UK audience, perhaps. The word queer has been replaced with strange. Many words relating to pejorative physical descriptions about somebody's um, weight or their physical attractiveness have been removed altogether. One of the stranger additions is uh, the inclusion now of a dedication in George's Marvelous Medicine. It says, this book is for doctors everywhere. This is not Dowell's dedication, uh, but now it's in the text. The Telegraph's claim that there has never been an alteration on this scale is just not true, because Dowell's work has changed and changed radically over the years in response to this changing audience and this changing idea of childhood. I want to look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It's possibly the most beloved, but it's the most frequently adapted of all of Dowell's works. 
And I want to use this work really to point out that while people are clinging to ideas of this original text, this, this, what is this original text that they read, I'm doubting that very many people in this room have ever read the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And the changes to this text are probably best demonstrated through changing illustrations. So while most of us now think of Quentin Blake's work as being absolutely synonymous with Doug, Blake didn't actually illustrate Charlie and the Chocolate Factory until the 1990s. Um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was published in 1964. And the original illustrations, the Oak Lovers, look like this. The original British edition doesn't feel much better. The original Loompa Loompas were not little orange men and women, but black pagans. They didn't come from Loompa land, they came from Africa. They were smuggled out in packing cases by Wonka and their caves with chocolate beans. In the original, when Charlie and the other visitors to Wonka's factory catch a glimpse of the Oompa Loompas, they remark upon their almost black skins and their fuzzy hair. Charlie even asks Mr. Wonka if he has made these people out of chocolate. They can't really be real. In response to complaints from the National Association of Advancement of Colored People about the overtones of slavery in the book, Dow and his publishers edited the work. Dow writes in his letters that this is to degro his text. He's very clear about what the Oompa-Loompas are in his original narrative. So in later editions, the Oompa-Loompas come direct from Loompaland. They are funny little men rather than black ones. And the illustrations change to reflect this altered content. Um, you can see that Joseph Schindelman, um, who was the original illustrator for the American text, has, has reused the same positions and everything. He's just drawn over and, and whitened the Oompa Loompas. Um, but let's not overestimate the, the impact of these changes or give them more than their due. These textual changes may change the color and mask the origins of the Oompa Loompas, but it doesn't change the central power dynamic that's still at play here. The Oompa Loompas were still smuggled out of Oompa land in packing cases and working for beans until the 2023 changes, where they say that the Oompa Loompas made a decision to come to work for Wonka. It's a slightly more dignified one, but they make this more dignified by removing bits of the text. They haven't added anything in here. So these recent changes to Dahl's work have prompted these fierce debates for and against the very notion of textual change. And we've seen much ink spilled by people who want to cling to some nostalgic and misplaced idea of Dahl's original. But in the end, it's the publishers who have won. Because Puffin have announced that they will now publish two versions of the text, an amended version and an original version. And after weeks of free publicity, let's not forget, the publishers are now going to capitalize on this debate and double their profits. But they won't be publishing an original version because that version, with its black and Columbus and its colonial fantasies, belongs firmly in the past. Uh, thank you so much to Eve and to the Hub and to all of you for being here. It's just such a pleasure to do these events and wonderful that uh, you've come to join us this evening. The question that I think maybe animates our four very different perspectives here tonight is a, is a really interesting and difficult one, which is who owns a text, who decides what it says and what it means. And that's a question obviously that animates literature and theater and history, but it also animates law. And as Eve said in her very kind introduction, I study both constitutional law and law and literature. And it might seem strange as a combination of interests, because in many ways those disciplines seem very different. But I think they're surprisingly similar. Both law and literature are fundamentally about interpretation. And I think both law and literature are ways that we try to structure our reality with language, ways that we try to put some order on the complexities of life and give us some firm ground that we can stand on, at least temporarily. And constitutions, which is what I'd like to talk about today, are a really strange example of a text. They are texts almost everywhere, except for our nearest neighbor, who persists with an unwritten constitution, almost entirely unique in that. They are generally texts, and they are texts that are designed to do two things that are seemingly completely intentional. On the one hand, they are designed to be static, firm, and almost perpetual. 
And on the other hand, they are designed to be perpetually in a state of change. The reason they need that former function is that constitutions are bound up with the identity of a state. We tend to associate the birth of a state to the date of its constitution and the continuity of that state with how long its constitution might persist. We also think constitutions need to be static because they ground our institutions. They give us rules by which we can govern our shared lives together. And they protect some of our most fundamental values, including in almost all countries now, the most fundamental rights that that society believes in and protects those rights against attack. So important is constitutional stasis that some constitutions, very notably Germany, but also many others, have parts of the constitution that are purportedly unamendable, that maybe can never be changed because they are so fundamental. But at the same time, constitutions are texts that are built to change because they have to adapt to new people, new times, new circumstances, new crises. And indeed, constitutions are texts that set out the terms of their own change. Every constitution contains within it some procedure for amending it. And that is because, first, very few constitutions last unless they change. The oldest unamended constitution in the world is the Constitution of Japan from 1947, and I'll say a bit more later about the ways in which that has, in fact, changed, despite being technically unamended. But also, as well as being efficacious to change, it's also essential to legitimacy. Thomas Jefferson famously said the Constitution should be rewritten every 20 years or reaffirmed every 20 years because the earth belongs to the living and it can't be governed by the dead hand of our past. So to be a legitimate document to bind us, it has to change with us. So some change is essential, a necessity. Too much change can destroy our state and be a travesty. So how do we go about striking this balance? Well, different constitutions do it in different ways. Across the world, there are hugely different mechanisms for how constitutions can be amended. Some are very difficult to amend, some very easy. Some are amended very seldomly, almost never, and others very, very regularly, like Brazil, for example, or India. And in Ireland, we have a constitution that's somewhere in the middle. It's medium hard to amend, and we amend it medium often by global standards. That's basically where we fall on that spectrum. But in trying to answer that question of who owns a text, our constitution wants to be clear. It tries to be clear. We own the text. The people own the text. And Eamon de Valera, introducing the constitution that we have, the constitution of 1937, said the constitution makes it clear that the people are the masters. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because the people don't have control of everything. But what we can say from our experience in Ireland is that there is nothing that we cannot change. The Irish constitution puts all change on the table if we want to change something we can. And also that we do use that power and we use it to make very substantial changes. And interestingly, following on from Jane's wonderful conversation about changing children's literature because potentially of offensive language, this year, we in Ireland will be asked to amend our constitution to remove what many consider to be offensive language. In November, we'll be asked to vote on a change to remove and replace the language of Article 41.2, more commonly known as the women's place in the home clause, which represents, many people would say, an extremely outdated patriarchal view of society. It wasn't even very popular in 1937. It's much less popular now. And that is the latest, possibly not the last, in a string of changes that we've made to our constitution to modernize it, to change various things that we want to change, and perhaps to make it feel different. You could say that a change started in 1995 with the removal of the constitutional prohibition on divorce. But if the change started then, it accelerated so much in the past 10 years. We've changed our constitution to legalize same-sex marriage in 2015. We removed the constitutional prohibition on abortion inserted in the 1980s in a referendum in 2018. We removed the constitutional crime of blasphemy in 2019. And in a separate referendum, we further liberalized the rules on divorce. And the question is, is the change we're making even bigger than just those textual changes? We've changed those rules, and that's very important. But does the constitution now feel different? 
the constitution was always thought, sometimes excessively thought, to be an extremely Catholic document to reflect deeply Catholic social values. In fact, it was not widely off trend in 1930s Europe, but it certainly was a deeply Catholic document in its social values. If we change all these elements of it, do we change that feel? If so, when does it happen? Is it at some point along that line of changes? Is it at some time yet, yet to come? Is there a moment when the constitution switches in its identity because of the changes that we make? And this brings to mind the philosophical quandary of the ship of Theseus, that if you have a ship and you keep replacing different planks, at what point is it a new ship and not the old one? When the last old plank is gone or at some point when a threshold is crossed? That's a really interesting question. With constitution, I think the answer might be whenever we need it to be. The answer might lie in us. The constitution will respond and be different when we feel it to be different. When we feel the changes we are making are not just changes to text, but changes to character. And in that way, as Jane said, children's literature is defined by its audience. The constitution is not defined by its audience, but it might be characterized by it. And to illustrate that, I want to talk about another phenomenon, which is that constitutions can be changed without any change to the text. In constitutional discourse, we call this implied constitutional change or informal constitutional change, where the meaning changes, but the text stays the same. I mentioned earlier the unchanged constitution of Japan from 1947. The text has never been changed. But within the last 15 years, primarily under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, the understanding of the text changed wildly, particularly Article 9, which is Japan's commitment to pacifism, which gradually moved from having a very uh, rigorous meaning, defining a small self-defense force for Japan, to gradually a more expansionist view of what Japan can do in its self-defense. The text remained the same, but the understanding was transformed. The same thing happened in the United States in the 1930s. Before the 1930s and Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal government, the United States Constitution created a federal government of limited defined powers. If you looked up Article 1, Section 8, you could see every single thing the federal government was allowed to do. Under Roosevelt, wildly expanded. What the state could do, what it was expected to do, went from this to this, a vast expansion in terms of scope. The text never changed, but the understanding did. And I think that shows that rewriting is something that can happen without text ever being touched, that new understandings can arrive because of change that happens in us, we the reader, can bring with us new meanings, new understandings, new expectations. And the text that we find when we read the document is somehow altered in our eyes, even if it remains technically exactly the same. And to conclude, because there's so much more to say, but unfortunately, so little time to say it. As we look forward in Ireland, in terms of our constitutional future, one of the biggest questions we may face is what would we do to rewrite our constitution in the event that Irish unification became something that we were considering, planning for, expecting might happen. This is something I've discussed at a previous Behind the Headlines, actually, and it's a really complicated topic. I think that change would be so vast, it would require sweeping changes to our constitutional order as we have it now. I think it would probably require an entirely new constitution, a new document where we retell the story of Ireland in a new way, where we have a more inclusive we the people that are writing and giving ourselves that document. But I think there is one thing that won't change, the idea and the belief that the Constitution is a text that belongs to us. And though we have to respect that, change it carefully and cautiously and slowly, ultimately it's a text that we'll rewrite again and again to build a future that we want. Thank you so much. So, um, in a way, the work that I do, both as a journalist and as a fiction writer, is a conversation between me and people who may be long dead, women who were accused of witchcraft three centuries ago, um, a writer who was living and working 
um, in the early in the, in the late 1800s and right through the uh, early, the early decades of the of the 1900s. See the song that I'm thinking of, or the revolutionary women, women from kind of 1911 1922 period, and rewriting history as fiction allows greater potential to explore human creativity because history itself can uh, lay a cold dead hand on your figures, on your characters. So it breathes life into them. And what I'm trying to do with the people I choose to write about is um, shine a light on forgotten women, women in particular, or forgotten stories, or partially understood stories. And that brings me to uh, this image here. So uh, in 2014, I wrote a novel called The House Where It Happened about the last witchcraft trials in Ireland. Um, th they're known as the Island of the Witches. The trials were in Carrick Burgess, there were two trials. And the first one was a, group, a mass witchcraft trial. Eight women were accused on the uncorroborated evidence of one other woman. And you need to engage with the original texts in the first instance when you do this. And the original texts were fascinating. There were pre-trial depositions where witnesses um, told a recorder what their evidence was and it was written down. And we can read these depositions and it's hard to know from a distance of three centuries whether um, the words are recorded exactly as the witnesses said them or if they've been smoothed and reshaped. Um, there were also two newspaper accounts um, by a Dublin newspaper, the Dublin Intelligence, and there, uh, there was a pamphlet, and then um, there were letters as well. People were writing to relatives talking about this case. So it was quite sensational. It was all among the Ulster Fox Presbyterian community. And um, so I find myself engaging with all of this language and then trying to fashion a path through it to tell a story, um, which I did um, in a couple of different ways. I wrote a novel. Um, but because I also have a newspaper column, I use that as well to talk about subjects that interest me. So I also wrote a number of articles about it. And usually when you write a novel, um, it's written, it's published, you do the publicity, and then you move on. And what you're working on in the next instance is just urgent and nothing else matters as much. But I was never able to forget the uh, eight women and one man who were convicted of witchcraft in Ireland. Maybe I was, I was bothered by the way history silenced them, and by the way they were silenced at their trial when their uh, innocent pleas were disregarded. And it started me thinking about how history chooses who matters and which stories are remembered and which aren't. And I find myself going back to the original documents again to try and understand this. Uh, the two newspaper accounts are very, very brief. Uh, clearly, the journalists weren't paid by the word as they were subsequently. And the first report just says, um, it's, it's the Dublin Intelligence, by the way. I mean, uh, this, was, uh, this was April 1711. The trial was the 31st of March, 1711. So, you know, a couple of weeks afterwards only. And um, it says, we hear that eight witches were tried at the assizes of Carrick Burgess for bewitching a young gentleman or woman were found guilty and are to be imprisoned for a year and a day and four times pillory. Uh, and I don't know if this word leaps out at you, but the word that leapt out at me when I went back and looked at it again was gentlewoman, young gentlewoman. So we see that class is an element here. Um, and then I went back 
and we looked and other documents um, and accounts by the Vicar of Belfast, the Reverend William Tisto, who attended the trial. Um, he was born in Dublin. He um, was a friend of um, Dean Swift's, and he took a great interest in this trial and wrote about it. And he used that word gentlewoman as well. But he did something else as well. In a letter he wrote, he uh, describes Mary Dunbar, the young woman who claimed she was bewitched, uh, and he said she had an open and innocent countenance. She was a very intelligent, young, gentle woman. Word again. And he went on then to say that the eight women who were accused of witchcraft in his first trial um, were such, six of them were such variety of ill looks. He also used the term diabolical appearances. So you're seeing that women of a lower social class and women who were deemed ugly, who were uh, in some way, we discovered, we discover elsewhere, um, top mark, scarred, uh, claw hands, lame, somehow appearances went against them, even on three diabolical appearances. And so, you know, if historiography, uh, if the work of historiography is to look at events in their specific time, then I felt that the work of a writer was to help readers understand how individuals could be crushed by those time-specific forces. And um, so there were two very, I'll just run through it quickly in case you're sitting there wondering what happened to them, because I certainly was when I first came across the story. Um, they were convicted, um, the eight women in the first trial, and then one man in the second trial six months later. And the, this fit of the template of witch cases. Um, it, it was mainly women. You know, witch hunting was women hunting. But in about 10 to 15 percent of the cases, men were executed uh, for witchcraft across Europe. And they had a connection generally with the women. Uh, and this is the case in the Isle of Bee, which is the one man was uh, husband of one of the accused women and father of the other. So I find that very interesting. Um, what I was trying to do then was make the imaginative leap and direct attention to a story. And, and this was a conscious redirecting towards a gapped history. Um, you know, basically write people back into the record. And I, as I say, I did it through a novel, I did it through journalism as well, and then um, it still bothered me, and so I did some activism, and I started lobbying. I felt that there should be a plaque to these people, and there it is. But it took me the best part of a decade. I lobbied MLAs, MPs, ministers, councillors, jurors and chiefs, and really senior civil servants in the Northern Ireland office. And there was a lot of resistance to the idea of this flag. Um, for all sorts of reasons, I think very much to do with local political reasons. But I was also told things like, well, how do we know they weren't witches? And a flag would encourage pagans to come to the area, the public crime for pagans. And um, you are dealing with a particular part of the world um, where it's everybody doesn't laugh when someone says this. Um, and I also had to learn to nod and look respectful when these things were said to me, even though I was perhaps not feeling so respectful inside because you have to work with people because the excellent is the enemy of the very good. And to get this plaque over the line, um, you know, the, you needed buy-in across the political divide. And it happened in the end because of this woman, Councillor Nia Donnelly from uh, the area from Antrim, who, um, who understood that, that Ireland has a history of selective silence when it comes to stories. 
You know, we choose what to remember and we choose what to behave in ostrich fashion over. And this was one example of it. There are many we can all think I'm sure of dozens of examples. This was just one example, but she understood how it was important, not just for the locale to have the nine names on a plaque remembered in the community where most of them lived, but it was important for Ireland generally as well as just another of these um, silences and, um, and gaps. So just to conclude, um, language does more than reflect reality. It's a mechanism for reshaping and recreating reality. Uh, and I think that paying attention to forgotten or partially understood stories is an important act of reclamation and, and an act of empathy. And I, I think we can all benefit from it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, now that we're not on Zoom anymore, I have to bring my credibility bookshelf with me. <laughs> so uh, before I begin, I just would like to extend uh, my thanks to Eve for the invitation and to the whole team here at the Trinity Long Room Hub for your support. And to uh, my colleagues so far this evening, um, you really set up a rich set of threads that I hope I can do some justice to trying to bring together uh, in the last nine to 10 minutes, which I'll keep a very precise time for me. So, um, I'm going to open with a short discussion of how theater understands rewriting as integral to its work, how the work of Samuel Beckett in performance complicates this history, and how a recent incident uh, opens new and interesting terrain in this debate. So this evening on the panel, I represent the theater, which has been a site for thousands of years of what we might call textual events. Much, but not all of theater history is about projects that begin as literature, conceived and scripted by a writer, and I should note I'm speaking here of a Western tradition uh, rather than an Eastern or uh, Indigenous tradition that would be more uh, fundamentally embodied, but separate from that discussion, um, if we take the kind of uh, Greco-Roman classical tradition through to the continental European as our metric, um, for this purpose of the discussion, we're talking a lot about writers uh, and texts. Into other bodies and new spaces, this then has to be um, performed and integrated into a society in order to become theater as such. And if the work is successful enough, then it transitions into cultural contexts and times far removed from its origins, where the words inevitably change in their, uh, in their reception, in their meaning, in their significance, and even uh, which words we hear. This audience might think perhaps first of uh, Greek tragedy, or of the works of Shakespeare in realizing the truism that author intent is an extremely messy proposition, not to say uh, an unachievable horizon. There is the issue of textual instability in the origins, followed by years of translator and editorial intervention, and so it becomes a major scholarly undertaking just to know that one has the right words, so-called, anything that relates back to the author. And then there is the question of what is now culturally comprehensible or relevant to a given audience as it meets the staging. This is not only in the past. This is a 20th and 21st century issue as well. Um, that's what my visual aid is for here. So just to run you through very quickly, you might think I have Beckett's original edition uh, in the French, the, the play that we'll be talking about um, might be the first, but then I have a trilingual edition that goes to his reworked English, his reworked German, um, a second edition of German, which differs from that first one, the making of editions, um, this is actually Endgame, but uh, they, there's a 27 monographs forthcoming and a huge digital archive about the, uh, the genesis of these works, showing the notebooks and the manuscripts and those resources that trace back the choices. And then finally, the epigenesis, the kind of uh, theatrical notebooks, his graphs and his work that he did when he directed it. And this book, this book contains a completely different performance script of Waiting for Gatto than what the Faber Companion, which I did not uh, bring with me today, publishes in the collected works of Tim Beckett. So a student who goes to read the collected works edition um, would have to do prodigious work just to understand the hundreds of choices that have led to that. And when you sign a rights contract to perform that edition, um, even the people offering you that contract are not always aware of the, of the scale of choice that that might still involve, that you could be within um, notional fidelity 
to authorial practices or the epigenesis of the play um, with quite enormous variations in particular moments um, that, that you have to explore. So um, considering that, we might consider drama a matter not only of constant rewriting, but also of reworking. We look back at the context and ideas that we sense in the play in its origin, we find the best available version of the text for our purposes, and then we collaborate. We apply the skills and intelligence of directors, designers, dramaturgs, performers, and crew members to share this event with an audience. Each time we perform any older play, even each new performance, is the creation of a new world, situated in a new time and a new place, and with that specific audience. 20th century culture modified this arrangement in several key ways. First, with the emergence of copyright law, protecting the authors of works and extending that to 70 years, which um, happened in the middle of the existence of copyright law, hard power became vested in the writer um, over the reproducible element of drama, which is its underlying text. And several 20th century authors leveraged this ownership framework into fame and monetary success, which is a good thing. So broadly, we support uh, intellectual property rights in the theater because it, it makes a career in the arts viable and your work can't be stolen. At the same time, a flattening is occurring in theater hierarchies, especially in the modernist and postmodernist avant-garde, where theater making valued the innovations and contributions of directors and divisors up to and including major interventions, revisions, and critical underminings of canonical dramatic works. So many, many directors became famous, especially in continental European theater after the 1960s, because they were intervening and disrupting the authority of authors, um, both classic and contemporary. What we study in our Department of Drama here is therefore not only objects of literature as such, but the events of situated embodiments and enactments of work in a social context. We might ask what we own when we own the text of a play. And we have several metaphors for this that might clarify how we understand my main example, which I'm gonna to try to cover in four minutes. We can understand a play as a blueprint for an event whose enactment differs from that blueprint. And this draws on the language of construction where the author is likened to an architect. This architect's conceptual idea of the edifice is subject to feasibility studies, regulation, engineers, contractors, builders, and the finished building might differ substantially from what was desired. Where the metaphor fails is that in theater, the blueprint actually endures. So whatever has been done to the text, however radical, however extreme, however bad, in one performance, it nonetheless endures. It can, it can be reworked again. So you don't have the permanency of a building that an architect feels has been marred by some intervention made by the later collaborators. The director, Ian Rickson, in conversation with uh, my collaborator, Jonathan Heron, likened this play to a recipe. Again, the notion that a writer who makes the recipe has an end goal and a taste in mind persists, but now it's in the hands of the cooks. The tools, the heat applied, the in in incremental variance and in the substitutions, and of course, the identity of those eating the meal uh, will necessarily affect how the recipe is interpreted and enacted in the moment. Samuel Beckett and his representatives of the estate after his death in 1989 have been enamored of the metaphor of music for his works. They say that his plays are like musical scores. This renders the director into the conductor of an established piece and actors into more or less piccolo players with innovations preferred only within the range of interpretation that we might associate with a 19th century symphony or a concerto where the notes and the instrumentation should not be substantially changed. And uh, this, of course, extends a rather wide bracket of authorial control, if you hear that, um, asserting the moral right of the author, um, and it has been prosecuted in court cases over the 20th century and uh, only a little bit in the 21st, uh, to deny licenses to productions that differ too substantially from the published text. So now we come to the contemporary controversy, and the reason I was asked here today for behind the headlines. Uh, the recent headlines are a kind of viral story from the Netherlands. A student theater group at the University of Groningen chose Waiting for Godot as a play they wish to stage. They requested and signed a standard rights contract that includes the clause that restricts the performers to men as the play is written. They auditioned actors with this notification on the poster. And later, after rehearsals had begun, the entity controlling the venue for presentation associated with the university canceled this production, revoked the license, to perform in their venue because this violates university equality regulations that pro prohibit a restriction based on gender. The story then quickly devolved in my reading of the many uh, narratives and headlines into 
a cultural war story with almost no bearing on either advanced gender theory, theatrical history, or contemporary Beckett scholarship. Either this was a travesty because the Beckett estate is somehow hopelessly misogynist and retrograde in this restriction, and it's the restrictionist to blame, or it's a travesty because universities have run amok with so-called wokeism and an ideology of gender is poised to trample on our so-called classics. So this discussion has not been edifying. So what I hope in illuminating the theatrical history and a couple quick points here at the end, um, and then discussion, we might illuminate uh, what's actually at stake. So first, it is true that contracts and policies of the estate are written in too binary a logic. It no longer makes sense in today's world to discuss uh, plays restricted only to one gender. Um, even the, the, the scholarly history of reading masculinity as presented in the play does not allow us to speak only of men in this play. There are various performances of gender identity, power, masculinity, and the question of who or what is appropriate to depict this narrative or this story um, is opening radically from the time these contracts were first written. So that's the first point. The second is that a programming approach that fixates on the part of the university only on the gender uh, binary within a play, within the character or the casting, is also not viable because it overlooks the collaborators and the wider creative team and the social context in which it's being performed. So we cannot elevate the actors alone as the only relevant gender performance. We have to think about director, dramaturg, producer, the whole team, and the diversity of the range of practice because of this flattening that has occurred already. Um, similarly, if we program one play that has five so-called men on stage, um, then perhaps elsewhere in our program, we need to think about diversity and inclusion and what is the broader scope across the year of the play, not restrict a single work to uh, have to represent all of our current thinking about diversity and inclusion. There might be other reasons or other issues at stake. So um, the final point uh, to bring us to close is just that medium itself um, is unstable here. Theater, as we understand it today, is not theater as it was when the contract was written, when the play was written. Even Beckett in 1952 is not the same theater as the European directors of 1968. So theater, um, I think like constitutions, um, is for the living. So my emphasis in our research here would be of how can we ask those questions about how work transitions across time in the bodies that we carry. If theater is theseus of shit, to, to borrow a metaphor, um, then it is uh, a shift in which change is constant. It isn't a moment in which the planks are changing. Even if the planks don't change, the wood is graining away into the water. The water is, is changing. The bodies that are pulling this ship along are changing, and the observers who are standing up from the shore and seeing are changing. So there is this kind of constancy as we flow um, in the theater because we embody it. And so we're trying to build that legacy of Beckett in which um, the work is moving on, the thought of the work is moving on, and yet there is an openness that we can uh, approach up to what this might mean for us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nate, and thank you all for the week. I cannot believe we're already at eight o'clock and we've still so many questions unanswered, but if you've uh, enjoyed the discussion about text and the politics of behind texts this evening, then do join us again. Um, forthcoming events include on Wednesday, the 12th of April at 6, the book that gave us Shakespeare, 400 Years of the First Folio. My colleague, Professor Andy Murphy, will talk about Shakespeare and the First Folio. And of course, we're celebrating 400 years of that first book uh, of collecting Shakespeare. So that's Wednesday, 12th of April, 6 o'clock. Uh, and then uh, for our annual Humanities Horizons lecture, uh, 2023. This year it's going to be given by the distinguished professor of humanities and human rights, Professor Lindsay Stonebridge, and she's talking about totalitarianism and the humanities. It's on Wednesday the 19th of April, 6.30 in the evening. For both of those you can get information on the Trinity Long and Hub website and you can register there as well. And I really hope that many of you will join us again for that. Uh, but for so this evening, I would like to draw to a close by saying a few thank yous to our uh, generous sponsor, the John Pollard Foundation, uh, to the Hub team, the wonderful team at Trinity Longman Hub, and particularly Christina Hamilton and Ethan King, who helped put this event together. To everyone in the audience for joining us, thank you for your questions, thank you for your interest, and our Zoom audience as well. Uh, but most of all, to our four panelists this evening, very bravely coming out to talk to you on this topic. Jane, David, Martina, and Nick. Many thanks from all of us.